Good day all, and welcome once again to my YouTube channel. Today we are going to be looking at the second part of our video lesson on carbon and its compounds. And this time we are going to be looking at the allotropes of carbon. In the previous video, I gave the divisions of the allotropes of carbon, talking about the crystalline form and the non-crystalline form, also called the amorphous form of carbon. So we are going to consider each of them and then we'll see their diverse applications as well as their features. So just follow as I run through the series. So let's consider the allotropes. Allotropes of carbon. Mind you, allotropy is simply a phenomenon in which an element um, exists in various forms but having the same physical state. And of course, it's not only carbon that exhibits allotropy. We still have other elements. Elements such as phosphorus. Phosphorus can exhibit allotropy. We also have um, sulfur. Sulfur can also exhibit allotropy. Then we also have oxygen, amongst others. So these are known elements that can exhibit allotropy. All right? Then, looking at the allotropes of carbon, in the previous video, I gave the divisions. Don't forget, we have the crystalline. The crystalline, crystalline form, and we have the non-crystalline, the non-crystalline form. All right. Now, this crystalline form has two divisions. We have diamond, diamond, and graphite. So these are the two crystalline forms of carbon. Then, for the non-crystalline, we have diverse forms. There, we have a pool. We have a uh, suit. Now, suit is also called carbon black. Carbon black. Then we also have um, charcoal. Charcoal. We have lamp black. Lamp black. Then we also have uh, wood. Yes. So these are examples of the non crystalline forms of carbon. Now, we are going to take them one after the other. We'll start by looking at the crystalline forms of carbon. To start with, let's look at diamond. Now, diamond is considered to be the hardest substance, naturally occurring substance known. And again, diamond happens to be the purest naturally occurring form of carbon. Please take note of that. The purest naturally occurring form of carbon is diamond. Some of the features of diamond include it is octahedral. It is octahedral in shape. It has a three-dimensional lattice structure. It has a three-dimensional lattice structure. Okay. And it has a density, a density of 3.5 grams per cm cube. Very, very dense. And it is colorless. It's colorless and transparent. It's colorless and transparent. Then it is very hard. Diamond is very, very hard. In fact, uh, the hardness of diamond cannot be overemphasized. I think that uh, diamond is said to be very, very hard to the point that it is usually very stable to heat. So I can say that the thermal stability of diamond is exclusive. Meaning that when you subject diamond to a very high temperature, of about 2,500 degrees Celsius. That's when you now start seeing changes. So that's to show that uh, diamond can withstand extremes of temperature. All right. Then we also have uh, diamond as a non-conductor. It's a non-conductor of electricity. And what does this mean? It means that it doesn't conduct electricity. The reason why diamond is a non-conductor of electricity is because its valence or mobile electrons, they are not free. And of course, um, in diamond, the valence electrons, talking about the four valence electrons, they are actively involved in bond formation. So it means that there are no free or mobile or valence electrons that are actually going to be carrying this electric current. All right? So that's the reason why diamond is a non conductor of electricity. Another unique feature of diamond is that um, its hydrophobicity. Hydrophobicity. And what does this mean? It means that diamond does not have any affinity for water. So it means water does not wet diamond. 
That's even the reason why it's used in the making of gemstones, in the making of jewelry. Why? Because it doesn't get easily corroded. All right. So that's one unique feature of diamond. Again, it's lipophilicity. Yes, lipophilicity. And what does this mean? It means that diamond can be easily stained by oily substances. That's even the reason why one of the uses of diamond is that when cut and polished, polished in, the, in that can be stained by oily substances. It also can be used in the making of precious gemstones or jewelry. Alright? So that life of felicity means that diamond can be easily stained by oily substances. Let me explain something about this life of felicity of diamond. Are you aware that artificial diamond also exists? Man-made. And artificial diamond can be synthesized or produced when graphite is subjected to a very high temperature under standard pressure and then it produces what? Artificial diamond. Then when this artificial diamond is produced, it is being extracted upon the application of oil. So oil on artificial diamond makes it to be very easily uh, recovered or extracted and to produce that, uh, to yield that artificial diamond, all right? So that's one unique feature of diamond. We still have other unique features of diamond. In terms of its thermal stability, I've just said that, and some other unique features as well. But mind you, in terms of the uses of diamond, diamond can be used in the cutting of glasses, even in metals, due to its hardness. Then again, due to the hardness of diamond, there's a test in chemistry that is called the Vickers test. Vickers test. Now, Vickers test is a test that is used to confirm the hardness of metals. And it happens to be that diamond is the unit that is being used in Vickers test. Why? Because of diamond's hardness. So I can say that diamond is a standard that is used as a unit in Vickers test. All right? So that's also very important to take up with also. All right? Then, uh, again, diamond can be burned. Yeah, it can be combusted. Now, when you react diamond with oxygen in air, at a very elevated temperature of about 900 degrees Celsius. Yes, diamond can be converted to carbon dioxide. So that's the another very important thing that you need to take on this answer. Then again, when diamond is cut and polished, it can be used in the making of what? Jewelries. Due to the hardness of diamond again, it can also be used in the making of drilling tools that are used for mining. All right? So these are some unique things or features about diamond. Then let's quickly progress to looking at the second crystalline form of diamond called graphite. Considering graphite, graphite in terms of its features, the features of graphite includes one, uh, it is hexagonal, it is hexagonal in shape, then it has a two dimensional lattice structure it has a two-dimensional lattice structure all right and again it has a sheet it has a sheet and layered structure it has a sheet and layered structure then also it is a good conductor it is a good conductor of electricity. Now, uh, looking at these features of, and again, I, let me include one, it has a density, it has a density of 2.3 grams per cm cube. Now, comparing the density of graphite to that of diamond, you should know that diamond is denser than graphite. Take on instance of this. Graphite occurs naturally as plumbago. It occurs naturally as plumbago. Plumbago. So this can be seen to be the ore of graphite. All right? Then let's consider some of these features. And let me explain some certain concepts about these features. Now, starting with the layered and sheet structure of uh, graphite. Now, it is due to this layered and sheet structure of the, uh, graphite that actually makes it to function as a good dry lubricant. And of course, by dry lubricants, we are referring to solid lubricants that helps to reduce friction between two surfaces in 
contact, all right? And then this is actually a good dry lubricant because of this sheet and air structure. Then it is a good conductor of electricity. Listen, it is not all the valence electrons of graphite that are involved in bond formation. Interestingly, among the four valence electrons of graphite, only three of them are involved in bond formation, while one is actually not involved. So that one is considered to be the mobile electron that enhances the uh, reason why graphite is a good conductor of electricity. So between diamond and graphite, the one that is a good conductor is graphite. And that's the reason why carbon at large, being an element, a non-metal that is the only non-metal that conducts electricity. In what form? Is it diamond or graphite? Of course, the answer is graphite, all right? Then, um, again, looking at some of the applications of graphite, because I just want this lesson to be very, very, very brief. Now, looking at the applications of graphite, we have uh, it. There, there was actually a French painter that did something. And what did he do? In the year 1795, a French painter named Jacques Comte did something. And what did he do? He simply mixed graphite with clay and was able to obtain lead and that's the lead that is used in pencils all right so it means that if you are asked a mixture of graphite and clay is used in the making of lead in pencils all right so take cognizance of that so it was done by that man so that's one application of graphite then another application of graphite is seen in the uh, moderation of fast moving neutrons in atomic power. So I can say that graphite acts as a neutron moderator in atomic power or nuclear reactor. Then, neutron moderator, what does that mean? Neutron moderator. Now, by neutron moderator, it means that graphite is able to slow down fast moving neutrons in atomic reactors or in nuclear reactors or atomic power, all right? That neutron moderator, it means that they slow down. Never should you mistake neutron moderator for neutron absorbers. For neutron absorbers, these ones, neutron absorbers, they tend to stop fast moving neutrons in atomic power. So these ones, they stop. Then while these ones, they what? They slow down. Now, an example of a neutron moderator happens to be, we have graphite. Then we also have another substance that can function as a neutron moderator called heavy water. Heavy water. And heavy water is also called D2O, which is deuterium oxide. All right? The why that of examples of neutron absorbers includes, we have the cadmium rods, we have cadmium rods, and then we have boron rods. So these are examples of neutron absorbers. All right, so graphite happens to be a neutron moderator. All right, then we still have other uses of, uh, of graphite. It can even be used in the making of paints and some other things. So these are the things that we need to cover concerning diamond and graphite. All right, then let's quickly progress to looking at the industrial manufacturing of Graphite. So it means even when graphite occurs naturally, it can be synthesized or produced artificially in the industry. And there was an American scientist that first did that, and his name is Edward Edward Atkinson. Now Edward Atkinson was able to uh, manufacture graphite in large amounts in the year 1884. And what did he do? Now, he simply subjected coke, which is an amorphous form of carbon, to a very high temperature and pressure. And then he was able to obtain graphite in large amounts. But meanwhile, he didn't just get graphite directly. What happened was this. When he saw, first, he heated coal, coke rather, and he reacted it with ether. Now, when he did this, he was able to obtain silicon carbide. Now, he wasn't able to get the, the uh, graphite that he was interested in having. So, after heating coke with silica, he obtained silicon carbide. 
And silicon carbide was actually known for its thermal stability as well as its hardness. And then that's even the reason why silicon carbide is used in the making of bulletproof vests. Sure you understand. And then again, after subjecting of this scope and um, silicon carbide to a very high temperature, it was able to obtain graphite in appreciable amounts. So that's the reason why um, till today, if you hear of Parkinson process, it is actually the process that is used in the industrial manufacturing of graphite. All right. So let's quickly dive to looking at uh, the amorphous form of carbon. The amorphous forms of carbon. Now, looking at the amorphous forms of carbon, talking about the non crystalline forms of carbon, the force that we are about looking at now is coal. Now, coal is a very unique form of carbon. It happens to be the main uh, source of mineral carbon. So in case you are asked, what's the main source of mineral carbon? It happens to be coal. Now let's see how coal was discovered. Now many, many years ago, there was earth movements that led to the uh, you know, burying of dense vegetation, talking about the plant covers. And when these plant covers now got themselves buried underneath the earth, what happened was that there was decomposition of this matter. And when it decomposed, there was the deposit of a dark, blackish substance, which was later named to be called coal, with the release of some gases such as methane gas, you have a CO2 gas, even water vapor gas, all right? Now, this coal that was now later discovered due to the fact that there was a dark deposit of carbon that was seen, was now later named as coal. That period of formation of coal was called coalification. Coalification. Or you can call it carbonization. Is that you call it qualification or carbonization? All right. So that's the period that led to the formation of coal. And this qualification uh, process is not just uh, a direct process that led to the formation of coal. No. Now we have different kinds of coal that we have formed in stages during the qualification process. And what are some of these kinds, these types of coal? The first is peat. So the first coal to be formed during the qualification period or carbonization period was pit. Then while the second was uh, lignite. lignite. Then the third was bituminous coal. Bituminous coal. Then while the fourth was anthracite. Anthracite. All right? Now, lignite is also called brown coal. Brown coal. Then while Bituminous coal is also called soft coal. Soft coal. Anthracite is considered to be the purest, the purest and hardest, hardest coal. So take cognizance of that. The purest and the hardest type of coal is considered to be called anthracite. And these are the stages. The first is split, second is lignite, third is bituminous, and fourth is anthracite. Now you can subject coal. So what is known as destructive distillation. Now the destructive distillation of coal results in formation of four products. Before we look at the four products, let me explain what destructive distillation is. When you hear of destructive distillation, what comes to your mind? It is simply the burning of a substance in the absence of air. So when coal is burned in the absence of air, it produces four products. We have them to be coal tar, coal tar, then we have coal gas, then we have coke, and we have uh, ammonica liquor. Ammonica liquor. All right? So these are the products that are obtained from the destructive distillation of coal. Destructive distillation of coal. All right? And they may be tested in some of the applications, of course. Coal can be used in road constructions and the repairs of leaking roofs. Then we also have uh, coal gas as an important industrial gaseous fuel. And then coal. Coal can be used in the, uh, in the manufacturing of important industrial fuels, such as we have the water gas, 
water gas, we have the producer gas, then we also have the synthesis gas. So we have water gas, producer gas, and synthesis gas. Of course, the constituents of water gas is CO plus H2, that's carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas. The why producer gas is CO plus N2, carbon two oxide and nitrogen gas. The why synthesis gas is CO plus three molecules of uh, hydrogen gas, all right? So take cognizance of that. Again, coke can also uh, be used as foil in steam engines, powering of steam engines, such as our trains and all that. Then, for ammoniacal liquor, this one is basically employed in the manufacturing of fertilizers, all right? So these are some of the applications of uh, coal, coal rather. So let's progress to looking at uh, the next amorphous form of carbon. Now the next amorphous form of carbon is, let's see wood, wood. Now wood is actually an amorphous form of carbon that is made up of three main elements. And what are these? We have carbon, we have hydrogen, and we have oxygen. But meanwhile, um, wood has a low carbon content, very low, low carbon content, all right? So it means that the content of hydrogen and oxygen is higher in wood when compared to that of um, coal, all right? So this one is characterized by its low carbon content, and it also undergoes destructive distillation. So the destructive distillation of wood still yields four products. And what are they? We have the wood tar, we have the wood gas, we have the charcoal, talking about the wood charcoal, and we have the pyrolignous acid. In case you are asked, what is the only liquid component of uh, the destructive distillation of wood? It is actually the pyrolignous acid. All right? That's the only liquid component of the destructive distillation of wood. Let's quickly look at charcoal. Charcoal. Now, charcoal is another amorphous form of carbon that is obtained from the combustion of some materials, such as animal materials, even wood material, as well as even sugar. So, hence, charcoal are of three kinds. We have the wood charcoal, we have the wood charcoal, we have the sugar charcoal, the sugar charcoal and we have the animal charcoal, the wood charcoal, the sugar charcoal, and animal charcoal. Now looking at wood charcoal, it is actually obtained from the destructive distillation of wood. And of course, uh, in terms of its application, because most times, exam bodies love to test students' ability on how well they understand the applications of this charcoal. This word is usually applied as it can be used in gas mask for the adsorption, the adsorption of poisonous gases, poisonous gases, and also it is used in the purification, in the purification of noble gases. Is used in the purification of noble gases. Then why that of sugar charcoal? This one can, can function as a good reducing agent. Can function as a good reducing agent. And please take note of this. Sugar charcoal is considered to be the purest, is the purest type of amorphous form of carbon. So sugar charcoal is the purest type of amorphous carbon. So take cognizance of that, very, very important. The purest type of amorphous carbon is sugar charcoal. So it means that sugar charcoal is purer than the purest type of coal being anthracite. So don't forget that. So it has, the reason why it's even considered to be the purest is because it has a very low impurity, almost zero impurity. But in the case of wood charcoal, the impurity is actually sulfur. So it contains some traces of sulfur impurity, all right? That's for wood charcoal. 
Then for children, uh, animal charcoal, in terms of its application, this one it can be used in the absorption, in the absorption of coloring matter. Coloring matter. Alright? So that's his work. It can be used in the absor absorption of coloring matter. So I can say that animal charcoal has uh, you know, applications in sugar making industries for the removal of uh, the color, the brownish color of sugar. Alright? Then again, this animal charcoal has some impurities. And the main impurity that is found in animal charcoal is calcium, calcium, tetra ozo phosphate 5. So this is the impurity that is usually present in um, animal charcoal. So we have looked at some applications of these uh, different kinds of charcoal. So don't forget the purest remains sugar charcoal. Then the next that we'll look at is on soot. Of course, you know what soot is. Soot is actually carbon black and it can be used in the making of car tires, even carbon paper. That's what is being used in receipt duplication. You are aware of that. Then it can also be used in the making of printer's ink as well. Same with that of the lamp black, okay, and others as well. So we've been able to look at the main things about the uh, allotropes of carbon, talking about the crystalline and the non crystalline forms of carbon. So it's my hope that you've been able to understand everything that I've just explained. So in our next video, we'll be looking at uh, the oxides of carbon. So just stay tuned and follow through this series. Don't forget to subscribe, invite, invite your friends to come to this channel and then follow up the classes so that you don't miss out. I wish you guys all the best. Thanks.